Welcome to Angels and Demons Part 2. If you missed Part 1, go back and watch that. We are setting foundation, building upon where we went, okay? And so you know this already, that there is a huge interest in pop culture today around this subject matter, around the supernatural, around the paranormal. You just take and look at any of the big box office hits, certainly this time of year in this season, and what do you find? It's gonna be something about paranormal activity, it's gonna be something about supernatural, about spirits, about other realms. We have things from monsters and vampires and ghouls and goblins and ghosts to spirits, to exorcism, Demons, we see this interest in angels and demons in our pop culture, and we see what's portrayed on screen, but all of that is fake, right? Well, a lot of it is fake. A lot of what we see presented in Hollywood, is a lot of what is presented as truth is a distortion but there is something to be said about all of this. There's something to be said about the supernatural. There's something to be said. In fact, we started with it last week. Let me just remind you by giving you a couple of truths. Here's two truths. Here's the first one is that the unseen realm is real. What we don't see with our eyes, what's happening beyond this natural world around us is just as real. Now, I may not be able to touch it like I can reach out and touch you, Brian, but it is just as real. There's the reality that the unseen realm exists. And so we look oftentimes at information, we look at literature, we look at movies, and we let those things begin to define what is real and what is not real, and also some things that are untrue about them. So let me just give you an example. Did you know that angels don't have wings? Did you know that? Angels do not have wings. Now, you would say, well, what about cherubim? Who have... That's a different creature. When we start to look at scripture, we'll find places. Let me give you another example. What we know and what we see oftentimes about the demonic, because we're talking about demons a little bit today, is we would think that the number one objective is somehow to, I don't know, possess some individual and make some puppet as a string kind of thing. But did you know that there's motivations much, much bigger than possession behind all of this? And so there's this reality that exists beyond what we see with our eyes, that the unseen is real. And when we start looking at this reality, the second truth is this, is that what we see with our eyes is temporal, but what we cannot see is eternal. What we see with our eyes, the things that we make our life about, the things that we're pursuing, our passions, our interests, our possessions, the things that we acquire and accumulate, those things, my friends, they're passing away. They will decay. They will die. They will go the way of the grave, that we will leave them behind. They are temporal things. But what we do not see, what exists beyond the eyes, well, my friends, that lives on forever. What is seen and what is unseen, temporal and eternal. You and I are eternal beings. You know that? that you and I were created with mind, body, and soul. We have a spirit. You and I, acknowledge it or not, there is life after this one. And so we will live on forever, eternity, eternal. And so as we look at this subject, as we talk about angels and demons, as we dig into this from part one to part two today, as we move through it over the next several of weeks, I just want to kind of set a couple of disclaimers. I gave you a little bit about this last time. We're not here to make much about the devil. We're not here to make him famous. We're not here to lift him up into the limelight. Quite the opposite. No, we're here to make much of Jesus. And so as we look at things, we're not here to glorify. What are we doing? Well, we're doing what scriptures tells us to do in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Here's what it says. It says, here's the reason, here's why we would talk about this, here's why we bring it up on Sunday mornings, is so that we would not be, and what's the word here? You wouldn't be outwitted, outsmart. So we see everywhere that the devil is scheming, that he's planning, that he has orchestrated a plan, and we're talking about it so that we wouldn't fall victims to it, so that we wouldn't be outwitted, so that we would not be ignorant, lacking knowledge about. And so we talk about these kind of things also in Ephesians 5, 
We talk about them because there's something that's happening within our culture. There's something that happens on the big screen, but there's also something that happens within our hearts and our interests. And this is what scripture would say about it, is have just a little bit to do with. It says, have nothing to do with. Draw a line, cut it off, separate yourself from it. Have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness, but you should do what? You should get out your big Q beam with a million candles and you should begin to shine some light into the darkness. And so that's what we're doing in this series. It's really not about camping out and hanging out around the concepts of angels and demons for the sake of that. And so that we would be prepared, so that we would be equipped, equipped and not be found ignorant. All right, so let me just kind of give you a couple things here. Today's format and the format for the, all of this series will go really quickly. There's going to be a lot of scripture that's going to come up over the next few minutes. You're not going to be able to retain it all. What are you talking about? What is she saying? Yeah, I, I, what are, I don't even know what that was about. She didn't get that. We'll try again, okay? That's what she said. So as we move through things today, we're going to move quickly. You're welcome to do one of a couple of different things. I'll make the notes and scriptures available to you on social media after all of this. Or you can snap some photos, jot down some notes and some scriptures, but I want you to look at this for yourself, okay? All right, and so let's jump in just a little bit here. Oh, the last thing is if you have questions about anything here, so I got one question last week, if you have, and it's going to come up today. If you have questions about anything, about the supernatural, about devils, about demons, you're welcome to write them down. You grab one of the little cards, a piece of paper, I don't care what you write it on, gum wrapper, and put it in the box at the end of today, and then our team's gonna look at it. It'll probably show up in one of these sermons over the next couple weeks. If not, I'll take it on on social media. Second thing you could do is you can text us, you can message us anywhere you can reach us. Just say, I have a question about angels and demons, list out the question, and then we'll likely roll it into here, okay? So you'll see one of those questions come up today. All right, I think that's my disclaimers. So let's go into this idea here so that we know that there is something beyond what we see with our natural eyes. Let's talk about the unseen. Let's talk about this invisible battle that's going on. And we started this idea just a little bit last week as we set up the foundation for this, and we read this idea here. This is Paul talking about the supernatural. He's going to talk about demonic. He's going to talk about powers. And in this place, we actually have more information from Paul about the demonic than really we do anywhere else. And so let's take a look here. This is Ephesians chapter 6, and it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You've probably read this one, heard this one, certainly if you were with us last week. It's not against flesh and blood. It's against what? And let's say them together. It's against rulers, and it's against authorities, and powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of, and where do they exist? Not where we see them, not in the physical realm. They exist in another realm. So Paul is talking in this moment and he's writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. And now just a little bit of context because context is important when you're reading scripture is there's something that is unique about Ephesus and they are really close to this occult culture meaning that they would borrow ideas from the world around them. Although they knew better, they knew they weren't supposed to, they'd begin to blend things from pagan cultures inside of Christianity. They would begin to practice things. They had come from these dark backgrounds. The occult was common around Ephesus. And so when Paul is writing here, he's writing not to, not to alarm them. In fact, notice the tone here. Paul isn't writing in scary, spooky, ooh. Paul's writing trying to bring believers up to speed. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know what's going on. There's something beyond what you see. There's rulers, there's authorities, there's demons, there's devils. There's all of this stuff happening. There's a hierarchy. There's an authority to it all. I just want you to see that these things exist. And so Paul's not trying to trigger fear. Us covering angels and demons is not meant to trigger fear. It's to prepare us. It's actually quite the opposite, to build your faith. And so what you see is not all exists. There's this battle that's going on in 2 Corinthians uh, 10. Here's what it says. You can go to the next one for me. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4 says, Though we live in the world, we do not wage war. All right? And there's the concept that we started to allude to last time. We're going to build into as we move through the series. This spiritual war that's going on. We don't wage war that way. There is a fight that's going on, but we have a whole other arsenal. 
right? Familiar kind of ideas. And so next week, one of the things that I want us to do is I want us to talk about how do we take a stand? When there's this spiritual war that's going on, literally the title of next week is Not Today, Satan. Like next week, we're going to take a stand. We're going to make some declarations. Not today, Satan. That's where we're headed in talking through the spiritual war. But I want us to go back and I want us to look at something. And I just want to kind of poke at your theology just a little bit if I can. And so over the next few minutes, I'm going to give some theological terms. You may have heard them. You may not have heard them. You're welcome to look them up. The first one is a theological phrase. It's very deep. It's straight out of Greek and Hebrew. Are you ready for it? Okay, I hope you're ready to write some notes down. Here's, here's the phrase right here. Very deep. I know, aren't you glad you came to church today, right? Are you smarter than a fifth grader? The fight ain't fair, right? This is what I want you to know, okay? And this is where I think that we miss this concept somewhere. Somewhere in our minds, somewhere in our theology, in our framework about who God is and who the devil is, do you know what we've done? We have positioned the devil as an equal. We've positioned the devil as a counterpart. It's like the yin and the yang. It's the opposites. Surely different, but equal. And the truth is, it's so far from that. God and the devil are not equals. This is an important concept. I just give me the head nod and I'll go on quickly, but until I get you there with me, do you understand that God and the devil are not equals to one another? And so no matter how, how much culture tries to patent this idea of it's good versus evil, it's black versus white, it's yin versus yang, and so one has to balance out the other. Nonsense. Baloney. And I'm going to spend a few minutes helping to kind of articulate this idea here for just a second. You need to see this. You need to see what it looks like. God and Satan are not equals. Why? What do we know? Well, here's the thing that we know. There's only one true God. Not dose, not God and Satan being the second. There is one true God. We sang a lot about that actually this morning, if you noticed. It wasn't really planned that way, which is really cool. There's one true God. There's the Alpha and the Omega. There's the beginning and the end. There's the one who existed before the foundations of the earth in time. And then there's the one who did not. It is not an equal. It is not a fair fight. There is but one true God. Now, let me do give you a few theological terms, and you probably know these. So as we talk about the character and the nature of God, as we look to contrast God and the devil, and we talk about whose role and who's doing what, and how does it all play in showdown, there's some things that you need to understand about God and that you need to have them first. All right, so let's just go in this, and I'll use them to contrast. But here, let's talk about God is, all right? And so maybe you know these, that God is omnipotent, that God is all-powerful. There is nothing that he cannot do. He says it, he declares it, and that's the way that it goes. God is all powerful. You'll see here that God is omniscient. And what does that mean? It simply means that he knows everything. He knows everything. And not only is he omnipotent, omniscient, he's also omnipresent, which means that he can be in all places at one time simultaneously. There is nowhere that he is not. There is nowhere that you can run from, escape from. God is there. He is present. And so we know these to be the attributes of God. We know them to be the very character and the nature of God. Now, let's just flip it and look at it conversely, because this is a really important part of your theology and how you view the devil and how you might view his demons. So God is these things, but Satan, well, Satan is not. He's not any of them. So let's just fill in the blank here. Now, Satan is a formidable foe. Don't mistake me. Thanks for that, Pastor Kevin. Formidable foe. I like that. Satan is a formidable foe. But don't miss this idea. He is not. He is not all-powerful. Satan is not all-knowing. Let me help you with something. Satan does not know what's happening between your ears. He does not read your thoughts. It's not some form of telepathy that he understands. If you're wondering somehow, well, how do people such as, I don't know, fortune tellers, or how does the devil, or how does demons, let me just help you, clue you in for just a second. He is not omniscient. He is not all-knowing. But he has been here for quite some time, as you've seen. 
And I don't know how much you think you're unique and different than the next, but you're a creature of habit. And all humanity has been for some period of time. Imagine being able to look on humanity and see their decisions and see the consequences and see how things play out in their lives. Now watch that for thousands and thousands of years. Do you not think that you could come up with great hypotheses and educated guesses about what's going to happen in the future of someone? My point is, agree with me, disagree. This is not debatable. He is not all knowing. He does not know all things. The last one is that he is not omnipresent. Now, as we talk about devils and demons, I get what people are, where people are when they make comments like, well, the devil had me up all last night. Satan showed up at my house. These are conversations. I just want to clarify something for you. It might have been a devil. It could have been. It might have been some sort of demon, evil spirit. There could have been. But there is only one devil as you know him, Satan, Lucifer, whatever name we're going to get to in a second. There's only one, which means if he's in China, he's not here. Vice versa. You understand? Give me the nod. All right, let's keep moving. All right, so as we look at things around the devil, it's really important to understand this idea of there is one true God and Satan is not him. He is nowhere near an equal. Let me show you these kind of things, all right? So compared to God, Satan is not omnipotent, not omnipresent. He is, well, he's impotent. He does not have the effective power. He is helpless and powerless unless, and we'll hit the unless here in just a few minutes. And so it's important again to understand this framework and your theology and who God is and who the devil is, and also to understand the order of creation. So let's just look at creation for just a second. Let's take this back to foundation. Let's take this to things that is no longer taught in our public school system for just a second. Can we do that? All right, let's go back to the beginning and let's talk about creation. Let's talk about creation before creation, before you were created. Let's talk about that for just a second, all right? So God creates the supernatural beings. So let me just show you a handful of scriptures just so that you can see this process, all right? So this one's long. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him all his what? Okay, now watch this. So praise him, all his angels, and praise him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and move. Praise him, you shining stars. Praise him in the highest places. Praise him. Let him praise the names of the Lord for what? He commanded and what? Okay, and they are being... All right, there's a whole bunch of things listed here, but angels are one of the things in the list. And so the moon and the stars and all of creation, it worships and it calls out to God. We see this in Romans chapter one being described. But however, here in this moment, we see something unique. We look into the supernatural and we see that God created angels and he gives them declaration and calls them to places of worship. And so he creates the angels in Hebrews 12, 22, it says, but you've come to the mountain of Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you've come to, and watch this. There are thousands upon thousands. Other translations say innumerable. And what are they? God, when he created in the beginning, when the creation account, when the foundations of it all went down before even the heavens and the earth, we see that angels were created. And then we start to see some kind of ballpark of how many the numbers are. And we're not talking about a handful. You're talking about an innumerable number, thousands upon thousands on all of these angels created by God exist and they have purpose and they have function. So God creates these and they have different names for them. You're going to find them throughout scripture. Let me just show you a few of the names of, in here. And what I've done is I've thrown just for most of them, I've thrown the scripture reference up beside. I realized as I sent this this morning that I missed this. I'll make sure I get it if you want it. There are several names and they are different from one another. As you read through scripture, it's not just like God created angels and there was just one thing. That's not the way that it was. There's quite a few different ones that are described and listed and some of their names help to define their functional role. Things like spirit, holy ones, stars, little G gods, angels, ministers, watchers, hosts, cherubim, seraphim, it's not even on there. So God creates these supernatural beings and he gives them responsibilities. So let's look at responsibilities for just a second. All right, we're going to do some teaching. We're going to walk through this and then we'll bring application to the end. All right. 
And so what do they do? When God creates these angels in the beginning, what was his role? What was his function for them? What did he want them to do? Well, here's some of the things that we find them doing throughout scripture. They would aid in divine counsel decisions. Did you know that there's a divine counsel of God? Did you know that there is in heavenly realms that God leans into the counsel of angels and entertains what their thoughts and opinions are at times? There is a divine counsel. Go look these pieces up for yourself. You can look this up in other places of scripture. That is one of many, many examples. There are other places where they assist in governing the natural world. Well, God will use them. He'll issue places of decree that you'll see here later to explain some sort of natural activity or supernatural thing that's going on around. There were places of decree, like when God sent an angel to decree, to declare the virgin birth, what was going to happen. Well, that's not the only place. It occurs throughout scripture. There's places where God will use them, like what he did with Lot in Genesis, where he would exercise judgment, where he would send the angels and judgment was exercised. There's places where the angels, it is their simple role and function to declare holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it is their function to be in the presence of the Lord, to be in the council and to, to declare holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And so God creates these supernatural beings. He gives them function. He gives them responsibilities. And as he's creating... Part of his workflow, part of his creation is God creates Satan himself. You know that. And this is part of the reason why we would say that they're not equals. God and Satan are not equals because one existed and was not created. And the other is a created thing by the power of this one. Do you understand that is a totally different playing field? And so God created Satan, and this is one of the descriptions, and this was written to, as a prophecy to the king of Tyre from Ezekiel 28. And what you may not know about prophecy, if you're new to the Old Testament, is oftentimes there would be a dual interpretation. There's something that was taking place in this that was applicable during this time, but for the most part, it is describing the created devil, Lucifer, Satan. And so let's read some of the description that's listed here in Ezekiel 28. You were the signet of what? Perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. And pay attention to this. You were in, you were Eden, in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone and begins to describe all of these different precious stones. And imagine, just visualize this for just a second. This is not the Looney Tune character with the cape and the pitchfork and the tail. You understand? And so like last week, when we talked about him parading himself, masquerading as an angel of light, there's this aspect of him that is beautiful in the beginning. And there's these jewels that adorn his body and he has functional role within all of the angels. And so God creates Satan. And so let me just ask you a question. The question that got posed to us, I'm going to pose it here and let's just answer it together. Okay. And so if God created Satan... And he knew that he was going to rebel. Did God create evil? That's a good question. I think it's a great question. If you have questions like this, I want to encourage you to submit them and let's talk about them, okay? And so did God create evil? And so let's just answer the question with scripture here for just a second. Let's look at a few pieces that describe the character and the nature of God. God is light, First John would say to us. And in him there is what? There is no darkness. James 1 would say to us that God can't be tempted with evil. And he himself, he tempts no one. And then the last one around this is that for you are not a God who takes pleasure in the wickedness. No evil dwells within you. No evil dwells within God. He can't have darkness within him. He does not tempt another individual. So God created the supernatural and God created Satan, so what happened? Where did it go wrong? What was the problem? And so let's look at this delusioned devil for just a few minutes. So let's look at the character. So contrasting some God character with devil character, let's talk about what happened and where he went wrong and the delusion that he began to have. So watch the declaration and just keep context here for a second, okay? You have 
the creator of everything, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. You have a God so great that there are creatures nearby declaring his worth 24-7. You're in the presence of this greatness. And then somehow you start thinking that it's okay, that this idea lodges in the heart. It begins to grow. He begins to say things. This is the devil. I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. Stars of God is a reference for the other angels. I'm going to be above all of them, above the stars of God. I'm going to set my throne on high. I'm going to sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. He's making these declarations of who he's going to be and where he's going to sit. And the problem is that seat is already occupied. Not by the I will one day, but by the I am. That seed has already been taken, but somehow he believes in his mind. He has the audacity. He has the boldness to begin to think, I can be not like God. I can be better than God. I have a better plan. I have a better way. And so he believes within his heart. He lets the pride and the ego begin to inflate himself. Look at how great I am. Look at how beautiful I am. And then what we find from here is we see this really interesting thing about the devil. And we find him in a position where it's not just him. That we find him with such great power and such great influence that he truly is a formidable foe. If you can be in the presence of the Lord and you can somehow convince a third of all of those other created creatures who's been in the presence of God, well, that, my friend, is a creature with a lot of influence, a lot of power. To somehow talk a third of the angels into joining the losing side, and that's what happens. He begins to recruit. He begins to pull in a third and so I think somewhere in here, I think we have to acknowledge something about angels. It seems as if, and maybe you haven't thought about it this way, it seems as if at least this type of angel has free will, has a choice to make. There's a decision going on in heaven, in the heavenlies. Now, there are created creatures that I'm not sure if they have free will, but it is very clear from here that they had the ability to make a decision. Is that right? Okay, and so there's, there's some sort of free will, there's some sort of ability to make these decisions that are contrary to what God wants from him. He exalts himself in his heart, he becomes completely delusioned, and then he commits absolute anarchy. He com com commits absolute delusion and then rebellion. So I wanna show you this passage of scripture. This is in Revelation chapter 12 here. If you were to look at it yourself, the heading for this is the woman and the dragon. I would encourage you to read this whole passage of Revelation right here. This is a great one. It gives you a good bit of insight. While we're on the subject, here's my hope. My hope is that I just want to kind of get you to think, to provoke thought enough that you would be willing to go home from here and to investigate what you believe, to dig into scriptures a little bit more, and see if your conviction isn't stronger on the other side of all of this. I want you to read Revelation 12. I want you to look at things like this. I've read it. I know what it says. You do the same. But inside of Revelation 12, in fact, let me just give you another resource too. So we talked about community groups earlier. We have a great group here that's just launched. It's called Till Jesus Returns. And what they're doing is they're studying a book about the book of Revelation. So they're using a resource to help look at the book of Revelation. If you're interested in this kind of stuff or interested in about end times, et cetera, I think it's Wednesday nights at 6? Wednesday nights at 6.30. So if you're interested, you can go to the, the app, just as we were talking about earlier. You can request to join. Make sure you don't miss that. It's going to be a great uh, teaching series. So that's a resource that's available. But again, we hope that you jump in, that you dig in, that you're studying, okay? And so let's look at what happens here. Let's look at Revelation chapter 12. Let's talk about the, rebel, uh, the rebellion that happened. So he's declaring, I will, I will, I will exalt myself. I'm going to sit on the throne. I'm going to be over it all. And well, God ain't having that. So watch what happens. 
So here's where it happens in Revelation 12. Now war arose in heaven, and Michael, who is an archangel, and one of his fight angels fight against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fall back, but he was... Let's just stop here for just a second. God, Satan, not equal. In this moment, just in the same voice that created could have also wiped him completely out. This was not a fight. This ain't a fair fight. I just want you to know this as we move forward, right? So we, we have an adversary. We have an enemy. We're going to get to the places here a little bit later about how we engage in this fight. But what I want you to see here is already we know what's going down. We already see where this is at. And so here this adversary, he rises up against God. He gets a third of his angels somehow on his side. And an all-out war is declared in the heavenlies. And you've got Michael, an archangel. He's fighting with the devil and the dragons and all of the demons. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, it is done. It is defeated. And in that moment, something happens. Pop quiz. Where is the devil today? Where is Satan today? Is he A, in hell, an abyss, a fiery lake, a pit, or is he roaming the earth? A or B? Let's find the answer. Here's Revelation 12, 9. All right, so he's defeated. There's no longer a place for him in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. He's kicked out of heaven. And the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, was thrown down to earth. He was thrown down to earth. And, and he's not alone. And his angels with him. So the whole third, the devil, there's no room for him in heaven. We're not going to tolerate that kind of behavior here. Boom, you've been kicked out. Where is he kicked out to? And he's roaming to and fro, seeking who he can devour. All right, that's where he's at, and that's where he's actively doing. Now, if you answered A, then you need to come back in a couple of weeks as we talk about when that happens, when that final stand, when that final judgment, when there's the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, when the ultimate being barred up and thrown into the pit. Come back. But where he is today, actively, as he is roaming to and fro. Verse 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown down in the ancient serpent who's called the devil. He's thrown down to earth. Thrown down to earth. We just sang this a moment ago. We were quoting Jesus when he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I was there. I was present. I was in the divine council when the whole thing went down. Yeah, I was like, yeah, that's my daddy right there. You know, the one that just, boom, kicked him out of here. I was there. I saw it. He fell like lightning. We see that this isn't a fictitial, fictitional allegory, as some might argue. Jesus himself is saying, no, I was there. I saw it. Some will debate this, even within Christianity. We'll debate whether the devil is real Looking, when, when Jesus starts looking in and he calls something out. So as we look through this, this rebellion is taking place. Jesus sees him fall like lightning. Verse 10 says this, and I heard in a loud voice saying, this is interesting, watch this. And I heard in a loud voice saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ has come. So he's been kicked out of heaven, or yes, the devil's been kicked out. And now the moment, the realization, okay, Jesus, you're going to have to go do your thing. You're going to have to go save them, redeem them. So this is where this is starting to play in here. And then he begins to describe. And he just, I included this verse because I wanted you to see this. This is what he does. And this is what you know. He comes and accuses. He accuses before everybody that you know. He wants to air out your dirty laundry. He wants to remind you about all the mistakes that you made and the errors and the stupid things. And he has great timing at all of that. Let me just put all of this right in front of you. That's what he does. He accuses you. Then he also accuses you in front of your heavenly father. There's somehow, and it's hard to even get your head around all of this, but there is a divine counsel that goes on. Read this stuff. And somehow Satan still goes and accuses you before God. There's still an accusation that takes place. And he does it day and night. 
And this is one of the tactics, and this is the, one of the ways that he holds us and he binds us as an accuser. And so we're going to hit this later in the series. So he sees him, he accuses him. In Revelation 12, 11, and they conquered him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony. We are more than conquerors. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. I want you to see this as we go through. They conquered by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony, and they did not love their lives even to the point of death. Verse 17, this is the end. We're skipping just a few, cha- a few verses down in chapter 12. Here's what it says in verse 17. It says, then, did I put the wrong one? 12, 17, here we go. Let me read it here. And then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to, what did he do? All right, watch here. All right, so the dragon's going to become furious with the woman. We're going to hit on this in just a second. This woman is Eve, okay? To make war and the rest of her, who's her offspring? Oh, good, good. Jump the timeline. The offspring, he sets out to make war, and that war is deceit, is destruction, and is death. The war started with Eve, the war continues throughout time, not just Eve's offspring, your offspring. And there's something about this, when I think about this spiritual battle and this war that's going on, I'm just going to be frank with you. Like, there are elements that I'm like, yeah, I'm looking out for me, okay, okay, I'm going to look. But when it's a whole other thing and I start reading, like, no, your war is against my offspring? Oh, bro. I'm ready to load up the shotgun, I'm standing guard, and I'm alert, and I'm sober-minded, and I see what you're doing. Sometimes it takes a little bit of like, what is happening for our generations and future generations? What's happening to our nation? What's happening to our country? What's happening to our community and our homes? It is his mission, it is his goal to do the same thing, to make war on all the offspring of Eve. And so let's go back. Let's look at this for just a second. Let's keep building on this idea because I need us to get there by the time we're here for next week. And so as we look through, God creates the creatures. He creates the world around us. He created the supernatural beings. And you know this. God creates you and I. God creates mankind. In Genesis chapter 1, beginning of the book, sometimes the most offensive language in all of the Bible, it declares God is the author. Not me. Not the devil. Not Satan. Not any of you. It declares that God is the creator. And so he creates man in his image. In the image of man, he created them, male and female. God blesses them. He says to them, be fruitful and multiply and go and subdue the earth, rule over the earth. God's plan for humanity, there was this in the garden scene. And it's interesting as you just look at this, especially through the lens of angels and demons. There's this seemingly connection between heavenly and earthly. Like the garden seemed to be this ground where heaven met earth. We see a few people who are present there. Obviously, God is present there. We see that he walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, so Adam and Eve are present there. And we're going to see in just a second, there's the serpent who was present there. Actually, we read that a moment ago when it said, serpent, you were in the garden of Eden. But there's also this divine counsel that I was talking about. This divine counsel is also present there in the garden in the beginning. So we see this where God's plan was to establish this place on earth that Jesus would pray. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. That's kind of the design on the way that it was up front. And so God sets this thing in motion, but then we have this evil one who's exalted himself and he's coming to bring his, let me say it in the words of ACDDC, dirty deeds and they're done dirt cheap. This is what he comes to do. That he comes to bring these dirty deeds and he's out to recruit and pull us. Watch what happens here. And this is Ezekiel chapter 28. Talking to the devil here, he says that you are in the garden, the garden of God placed you, you are on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire. 
This is where I got the sacred assembly earlier. When you go back and look this up, stones of fire is referring to other angels. Okay, so go back and look these up for yourself. There's something that's happening here. They're all in the garden. He's talking about Satan, the deceiver, about to do some dirty deeds inside of that garden. Verse 3 or verse 1 of chapter 3 says that he said to the woman, did you actually say you shall not eat? of the garden, of the eat of any tree in the garden. And we know this to be that famous line where he ultimately deceives. Sin enters into the world. It begins to spread around. We see places where the devil then moves on from here from deceit. We see other descriptives of him where he's defined as a murderer, where he's defined as a liar. And this is what he's done from that moment, from inside of the garden. From the very beginning, it was always, 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 number one goal. I could not exalt myself above God in the heavenlies. He has kicked me down here. I don't like his plan. I don't like his creation. I detest everything that is good and light and right about him. And so he begins his campaign to recruit as many as he can. And he starts with deception with Eve inside of the garden. And then he moves from deception into destruction. Flip your Bible over a couple of pages in Genesis and you're gonna see where he's in the ear, the murderer, the deceiver. When he's in the ear of Cain who comes and kills Abel. Murder, death. He's behind it, orchestrating into the ears of, and he's done this process from the garden throughout history and continues to do the same thing today. And it becomes the deceit and the destruction and the death. Let's talk about dominion for, for a second. Let's talk about the devil's dominion. So let me just show you a couple of things here. So here's, here's what we see. We know this already. He was kicked out of heaven. He was sent here. And this is where his dominion, this is where his authority sits so that we know that we are from God. So we're children of God. We are heirs with God. This is talking about believers here in 1 John. We know that we are from God and the whole world. Here's what we know. We're convinced of, convicted of. We know this to be true. The whole world, it lies in the power of what? Of the evil one. John 12, he goes on. He says, now the judgment of this world, now will the ruler of the world be cast out. Now this is happening a little bit later in, in timeline of scripture, but there is a ruler of this world. First Corinthians five, five says that you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved. Again, Satan roaming the earth. Part of his functional role is destruction here. Last one, verse 22. This is the one that you probably know. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked. He's looking for permission to sift you. And so the devil has this dominion here on earth. Let's bring a few ideas here together. And let me talk about why this is important, what it means to us and what it'll look like for us moving forward. So all of us, when he makes war, when he wages war, I had an option of whether I thought about it when I was 17, 18, would I join the air force? Would I join the military? What branch would I be in? This isn't an option. Like, you're engaged, like it or not, admit it or not, acknowledge it or not, believe it or not. There is a spiritual war going on around us. There is more than what the eye sees, that the spiritual realm is just as real. In fact, it is eternal. It is not temporal. This war that we're in, and this is why it becomes, this is why it becomes important. This is why it matters is to live enough of life and you experience the casualties of this war. We have an enemy who looks to steal, kill, and destroy. He makes it about you. He makes it about your marriage. He makes it about your profession. He makes it personal. He makes it about your children, about the next generation. And he's not looking to fight fair with you. He will manipulate you. He will lie to you. He will present himself as an angel of light. He will come and whisper things in your ear that sound like a good thing to do, a convenient thing to do. He will tempt you to join his team. 
to recruit you, to enlist you. For each one of us, here's what you should know. It ain't a fair fight. But you should also know this. Satan's authority, it's limited to the permission that we give him. The reason I could poke a little fun and use the word impotent to describe his power is that his power is limited. It's limited by the permission that you grant to him. Especially, especially if you are a believer. Let me just help you understand a couple of things just very quickly here. So because the devil has been given dominion over these places of the earth, when we find places where we give him permission, so let's just use this as entire cultures or communities for just a second. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a nation that is you know, plagued by things like voodoo, such as uh, some of the spots in Haiti. But ask some of who have been. You can ask my wife. I've been to places. I went to Holland, went to Amsterdam. There are places in which geographical areas, when you move into them, you feel this level of darkness and oppression. Why? Is that true? Can it really exist? Am I just noticing something? No, we find plenty of places where there are princes of this world, there's darkness of this world, and they have geographical regions that they inhabit and control and deceive. Why and how? They were granted permission by a community that invited them There are places where demonic possession. The devil does not have the ability to read your mind, to just come jumping in your heart and inside of your life and bring possession, meaning having taken control of you and your life and your will. But when we give permission, when we grant the authority to, we invite in. This is why it said in the very beginning, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, rather expose them with the light. Because there is something that happens where it seems as if the thing that's being painted to us, the picture that's being portrayed, it seems as maybe it's a good thing. It seems as if it's a subtle thing. It seems as if it's not a major thing. It's not a big deal kind of thing. But there are lies behind the disguise whispers in your ear he whispers in your ear and he looks to recruit you but his authority is limited to the permission that you end up giving him and so he will come and he will tempt you and let me just help you to see that the temptation while there's a ton of different types of sin but here's the temptation here's the thing that he did and here's the thing that he'll try to do with you too you can put it up here not this one the next one for me Put up the self, oh, you don't have this in. Self sufficiency leads to God uh, dependency. Let me say this away. Here's the temptation to be self sufficient and not God dependent. There is something that he'll try to bring out of you, and it was the same thing that he had convinced himself I can do it, I'm greater, I'm above, I know the way. And he'll try to convince you, he'll try to distort for you just what he did for Eve. He'll come and he'll bring God's scripture to you. He'll bring God's intent and God's character and nature to you. And he'll question it in front of your eyes. Does God really love you? Is he really for you? Is he really able to forget your past and somehow forgive you of those things? No, 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 I accuse you of them. This is what he does. And he'll try to bring you into the place where you will do like him and say, you know what? I don't need God. Been there, tried that, prayed it, didn't work out for me. I can do this on my own. I don't care what the scripture says. And you probably wouldn't say this out loud, but this is what our decisions, our decisions speak more than. And so when we're in these situations, here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to see. is when you rebel against God, you are choosing, you are choosing the same fate. When somehow we decide in our hearts that we are God, I'm gonna decide. Are you not doing the same? Have you not fallen for the same deception? That deception will lead to your destruction. That's what happens. Deception leads to destruction. 
And so for us, the reason that we slow down and we look at a series like this is because I want you to see something. This is so important. This is the last, last point of this before we move into next week, how to actually take our stand is there is something that's being told to us when the devil comes and he's looking to tempt you and he wants to bring you into his fold to make you to follow his way. You need to stop for a second. You have the ability to give permission. How do I know? Because of this verse here. And it says this, it says, do not give the devil a foothold. It would not say if it were not an option. You have the ability you draw the line. Maybe you're not familiar with foothold. Just imagine with me for just a second inside of your home that there is a door. The door typically stays closed. It needs to be closed. But as you're closing it, somehow the devil sticks his foot right in the gap of the door. Now the door is lodged open. And what a foothold is, by the door being lodged open, it now means he has entry access to your life in and out whenever he wants to. You got the key card, swipe it. Blip, blip. Oh, no thanks. I'll let myself in. When we begin to give permission to the devil, it's as if we have, here's a foothold. You come in and out whenever you want to. The door is wide open for you. I wasn't willing to close the door. I wasn't willing to slam the door on that decision. You can come in. You can wreak havoc. You can bring deception. You can bring lies. You can steal, kill, and destroy my family. And all of this, as Paul talks about it, was not meant to bring fear to anyone. It was simply to bring an awareness that our mind would begin to see that our spiritual eyes might be open. The reason that we're covering this today is because we want God's best for you. And more importantly, God wants his best for you. But there is an enemy of your soul, one that you don't see with your natural eyes, but he does roam around. It is not a cartoon devil. I wish it were that innocent. But his power is limited and restricted to what we give him access to. And so my question for you as we close here Permission granted or access denied? In areas of your life, permission granted or access denied? Does he have a foothold? Is the door still left open? Is there some way that he can get in and out? Does he have his hooks on you in certain areas? Well, maybe it hasn't been a problem for a while, but you wonder why you still stumble through the same thing over and over again. Maybe there was a foothold. You still have that issue that you're trying to walk through, the thing that you're trying to navigate inside of your relationships. Is there a, a foothold, something that was not resolved, something that you left open? This morning, as we talk about heaven and hell, as we talk about temporal and eternal, I just want you to be reminded, be reminded, this life that we're in is fleeting. Things, things are temporary. As you go through life, you're gonna face wars. Demons will knock on your door. You may not see them with your eyes, but you'll be tempted by things. For you, you are a child of God. You are the heir. And so you are more than an overcomer. He who is in you is greater than he who is the ruler of this world. And so for you, what does it look like to take a stand? And I hope next week that you'll be back with us as we talk through this more. But today I want to pray for you and I want to encourage you. If there are doors that are open, let's close them today. Do not give the devil a foothold. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. <clears throat> God, we acknowledge you as the one and true God. We acknowledge you as the creator. Father, we recognize that you have no equal. Father, the last thing that we would want to do is make great of the devil. But God, as we look at these scriptures, it, it helps us and encourages us and it prepares us for the battle. God, would you help us to close the door, to not allow there to be any kind of foothold? Father, if there are places where, where we have rebelled against you, we've chosen the way of the devil, would you forgive us of our sins? Father, help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.